How can a building represent a country? An embassy is more than just bricks and mortar. It's a symbol of a country abroad. Proud, grand, sophisticated. It should show all the airs and graces of a nation presenting itself on the world stage. The US Embassy in London is not just America's home away from home. It's the embodiment of a special diplomatic relationship. The special relationship. Special relationship. The special relationship. And the seat of one of the most coveted ambassadorial positions in the world. When it opened back in 2018, this wasn't just the largest embassy in the UK, but one of the most technologically advanced buildings on the planet. It's an array of high-tech security features blended seamlessly into a $1 billion fortress that's actually modelled on the castles of medieval Europe. But building it was anything but diplomatic. The US gave up what was seen as the best located embassy in London and a site whose history dates back almost to the founding of the Republic. And they traded it all for this, a post-industrial wasteland that most cab drivers would refuse to drive to. This is the story of America's most advanced and most controversial embassy. Okay, so you're a newly established nation and you want to open an embassy in London. There are a few things you should know. First off, you're going to need a headquarters. Now, strictly speaking, the building itself is called a chancery. The word embassy refers to the people employed there and the work they do. But for our purposes, we're going to call it an embassy. The embassy is considered American soil, sir. Look, boy, now I'm in Australia. Now I'm in America. Australia. America! Australia! Oh, America! America! Australia! America! Oh! Contrary to popular belief, embassies are not actually the sovereign land of the country they represent. But thanks to the Vienna Convention, you will get some pretty good perks. The host country isn't allowed to enter uninvited. And while the building remains under local jurisdiction, it's exempt from pretty much most laws, and you as a diplomat can enjoy full legal immunity while you're here. Appearances are everything in the diplomatic world, so you're going to want to join almost every other embassy in the capital by moving here to West London. It's normal to own your own embassy outright, but things are a little bit differently in Britain and you're going to need to take out a lease. More on that later. But don't worry, because West London has plenty of townhouses in fashionably exclusive neighbourhoods for you to set up shop in. Belgravia is the obvious choice. You'll be in excellent company in Kensington. Or best of all, there's Mayfair. Before you can start work, your ambassador will need to present their credentials to the king, which until not so long ago required the use of some very fancy dress. In 1932, when Ivan Maisky, the new Soviet ambassador, arrived in London, he asked Moscow if he should follow protocol and wear knee breeches at Buckingham Palace. If necessary, the Kremlin told him, you wear petticoats. Now, embassies take up a good chunk of the best real estate in London, but the US diplomatic mission had one of the best deals of all. You may know Mayfair as the most expensive spot on the London Monopoly ball. And it's here in Grosvenor Square, in the very heart of Mayfair, that the US had a toehold for centuries. So much so, it even earned the nickname Little America. It all happened in 1785, when John Adams moved into this little house on the corner and became the US's first ambassador to Britain. An ambassador from America. Good heavens, what a sound. Since then, it's housed two former embassies. And during World War II, it housed the European headquarters of the US Army and Navy. Then, in 1960, the US mission moved into this purpose-built embassy on the west side of the square. It's currently being turned into a hotel, but its appearance hasn't changed much since it was first opened. Built at a time when the US had reached superpower status, it evoked a country showing its confidence overseas. Designed by Finnish-American architect Eero Sarin, this monumental building combined ancient and modern forms. 
Like many structures in London, it's clad in Portland stone, which, along with its proportions, help it sit pretty well with its neighbours, despite its size. Remember how I said that Britain likes to do things differently? Well, the land in this square, and in much of West London, is owned by the Duke of Westminster. When the US tried to buy some of that land to build its embassy on back in the 1950s, the Duke replied that he would only sell up if America returned some of his land that was confiscated after the American War of Independence. A little place known today as Miami. Understandably, the US refused, but in a spirit of generosity, the Duke offered a lease with an annual rent of one peppercorn instead. But there's no need to go feeling sorry for the Duke of Westminster. The current Duke, Hugh Grosvenor, is worth over £9 billion. He's churning out billions off the 500 acres his family's owned since 1677. New UBS data shows that in 2023, billionaires acquired more wealth through inheritance than their own entrepreneurship. In addition to Grosvenor Square, the Duke's father left him an art collection worth untold millions. Meanwhile, many UK taxpayers are cutting Christmas spending to make ends meet. But working investors can still collect assets like these that have continued to gain value. And thankfully, we've come a long way since 1677. Now, everyday investors can invest in blue chip art straight from their smartphone with our sponsors at Masterworks. They have over 300 offerings from artists like Banksy, Picasso and Jean-Michel Basquiat. Art that's outperformed traditional investments for decades. Just take a look at Basquiat's appreciation versus traditional investments. Over 875,000 people are on board, including B1M subscribers like you. And altogether, those people have seen over $45 million in returns. Thanks to them, you can still skip the line and start your collection today at the link in the description. Now, let's get back to America's embassy in London. By the early noughties, the building was facing serious challenges. Post 9-11, security had become a major concern, and not just for the embassy. Now America's outgrown the neighborhood, and after 9-11, security took precedence over prime location. In 2007, a 15 million US dollar security upgrade created a ring of bollards around the site and closed this side of the square to traffic. The needs of the embassy began to outgrow the building. There was the security threat and regular protests outside the gates. So it all became clear the embassy had to move. But where to go from here? It really is the best located embassy in London. It's near all the best restaurants. Hyde Park is just around the corner if you fancy a stroll. And Buckingham Palace is just a short limo ride away. Well, to the surprise and horror of many, a new site was found in... South London. Now, for those of you who don't live here, South London, South London was historically seen as the less glamorous side of the city. Legend has it, taxis would even refuse to cross the river after a certain time of night. Of course, it's not, but in a business where appearances are everything, it was a pretty bold move. At the time, this area was home to a wholesale market, a sorting office, a cement factory, and not much else. But the choice wasn't completely out of left field. The embassy would spearhead a wider $48 billion redevelopment of the surrounding area. But even today, despite a glut of luxury housing and an outdoor sky pool in tropical Vauxhall, there really isn't much here. When President Trump complained that the embassy was moving to an off location, he kind of had a point. He was, of course, wrong about pretty much everything else in that tweet. The hunt for a new site began in 2007, and a year later, the new site was found. The development was paid for by the sale of the old embassy and other real estate in London. Around 800 million US dollars was reserved for the building itself. Construction on the winning design began in 2013. The building is a huge cube perched on top of an artificial hill, a nod to Motton Bailey style castles, while also attempting to represent the rock solid nature of American democracy. Elsewhere, the plan is a monumental effort to soften and hide the vast security features of this impregnable fortress. 
The main building sits in the center of a spiraling park featuring a mix of American and British trees. It's a deliberate nod to the English tradition of urban parks while also providing the required 100 foot clear perimeter around the building to cushion it from blasts and provide a clear line of sight. As you walk around, you notice that there's no imposing perimeter fence. Instead, intruders are kept out through the constant use of sleight of hand. The northern edge of the site is protected from the busy road by a hedge containing a row of anti-vehicle bollards. If anything were to get through it, it would career down this meadow before falling into the 8-foot moat below. Its 6-inch thick glass is dotted with stars to prevent birds from flying into it. Elsewhere, the entrance is guarded by pavilions. Over on the south side, the building is separated from the nearby plaza by a rising meadow. Concrete seating doubles up as a vehicle barrier, while further up, another nod to traditional English gardens, the meadow grasses, help to hide a trench. Known as a ha-ha, these were historically built to keep livestock out without spoiling the view. Now it does the same thing, but for people. The building attracted criticism when it was opened, and the comparison with a castle was taken the wrong way by some. The city's other famous castle, the Tower of London, was built by an invading army to intimidate the local population. The extensive security features, however well concealed, were seen by many as excessive, even in an age where enhanced safety measures are a fact of life. But as an embassy, it has to represent America's position in the world, both symbolically and practically. From the building housing the new superpower, confidently stepping into the shoes of the old world powers, to the inconspicuous fortress, keen to play down its size and power. As far as embassies go, it clearly breaks the mould. Perhaps in the game of diplomacy, that's all that matters. This video was sponsored by Masterworks. You can skip their waitlist at the link below. Don't forget that we're investing in the next generation of builders through our investment into BrickBorrow, a fantastic LEGO subscription service. You can learn more and get started today over at BrickBorrow.com. And as always guys, if you enjoyed this video and you want to get more from the definitive video channel for construction, make sure you're subscribed to the B1M.